practice in minutes instead of a month. Tommy Flowers realized that it was possible to read paper tape optically at very high speed, and this is going at 5,000 characters a second, 30 miles an hour that uh, tape goes through there. And it's quite incredible that it can actually read information at that speed. In fact, we did a test on how fast we could drive it before the tape broke, and uh, we got up to nearly 60 miles an hour. Um, um, <laughs> so, so we decided that was a bit... Oh, when it did break, it, it went all over the place. It just, just disintegrated. Colossus began operating five months before D-Day, the critical invasion of France in June 1944 that would turn the tide against Hitler. Tanks and guns choked every main road and street in southern England. The Allies prepared an elaborate deception. They set out to trick the Germans into thinking that the attack on Normandy was simply a diversion. Double agents in Britain relayed the false information to Berlin. But only the code breakers could tell if the deception was working. The Germans were deceived for a very long time, far more than we expected and far more successfully. But we also got a bonus, if you like. That is, we knew they were deceived. Because from Ultra we could see that they were not moving troops into Normandy. They had to say to themselves, they'll pop over to Calais. The Germans were not only deceived, they were known to be deceived. It was an enormous subterfuge and an even bigger gamble. Around the clock, the Allies searched for the merest hint of German suspicion. The invasion was poised to strike. But then, a vital message was decoded at Bletchley Park. Just before D-Day, Marshal Rommel, the Desert Fox, was appointed Inspector General of the Western Defenses. And he sent this enormously long message, very detailed description of the Western defenses, where each, each unit was located and what equipment they had. It was, was 70,000 letters, which was read. When Bletchley Park decoded Rommel's message, it contained alarming news. German tanks were massing at the exact spot where American troops were about to parachute into Normandy. They were going to drop the, one of the airborne divisions right on top of a German tank division. They would have been massacred. They changed it. It was June 4th, 1944. Reassured by the code breakers that all was well, the massive army began to move forward. Then came a discouraging setback. We went on duty that night, and they said, well, tonight is the invasion and they're going across. And so we slaved away. Well, of course, as everybody knows, by about four o'clock in the morning, the weather was so bad, they had to bring them all back, which, of course, was bad luck for us because they then came and said, well, you can't go walking about Bletchley when you know that the invasion's going to be tomorrow night, so we just had to stay there. 24 hours later, the Allies launched the biggest military invasion in history. We had dinner, and we came out at 11 o'clock, and I suddenly started to hear a hum, and it got louder and louder and louder, and I knew what it was. And about 10 minutes later, the sky was black with aircraft towing gliders. And my friend said, I wonder what that is. And I said, I haven't the faintest idea. And about three o'clock, I think it was, suddenly there was a real rustle. And 
very shortly the word spread that there had been German traffic saying that paratroopers were dropping all over the place. So we knew, we knew this was it. The decoded messages showed that the deception had worked. Hitler's troops were split between Normandy and Calais and were unable to counter the onslaught. Over half the German forces had remained in the northeast, awaiting an attack that never came. At Bletchley Park, those who knew about the invasion weren't allowed to leave for 48 hours. Even now, nobody was taking any chances. We staggered out feeling rather the worse for wear, but knew it was then general knowledge and went home. And my lady I was billeted on said to me, where the bloody hell have you been? And I said, well, I've been working. She said, well, you've missed all the fun. And I said, what fun? And she said, well, there was the invasion. It's been on the radio, because no television. It's been on the radio. I said, oh, lovely, you know. <laughs> I went to bed. <laughs> Tuesday, 6th of June, 1944. Invasion began. 10 a.m. breakfast. Letter from Maureen. Spent morning washing and ironing. On at four. Life quite hectic. Feel somewhat anticlimaxy. Now the second front has begun. Hmm. Not a bad day really. It had not been a bad day for the code breakers either. They had accurately foretold the position of all but two of the 62 German divisions. Enigma and Lorenz messages were read throughout the D-Day operation. By the end of the war, they had handled at least 63 million characters of high-level code between Hitler and his generals. In the months that followed, Bletchley Park would continue to chronicle the disintegration of Nazi Germany, right until the end of the war. Finally, at the cost of at least 50 million lives, the Second World War came to an end. When the final signal came through from Dönitz, surrendering it was in clear and not in code and that was extremely interesting because you felt the war was then really over when messages did begin to come through in clear uh, then the, all the secrets of the war really were beginning to fade into history already In the roll call of those who had brought about victory, the code breakers of Bletchley Park would never be mentioned. The operations there were to stay a secret for the next 30 years. Eight of the ten Colossus machines were destroyed. The remaining two were moved to British Secret Service headquarters where they may have played a significant part in the code-breaking operations of the Cold War. In fact, the Russian military had developed a code that was similar to the High Command's fish code, so the techniques invented at Bletchley Park were still to prove vital in a very different kind of conflict. In 1960, the order finally came to destroy the last two Colossus machines. That was a terrible mistake. I was instructed to destroy all the records, which I did. I took all the, the drawings and plans, all the information about Colossus on paper and put it in the, uh, in the boiler fire, so it burned. 